tonight we are delighted to have two really amazing personages here with us tonight. One is Mackenzie Wark, who we have actually been trying to get in the house for 25 years, if you can imagine that. So worthy of applause. We also have Anne Leslie Seltzer, which we're very honored to have with us as well. Um, both of them are really amazing theorists, artists. Um, there is a featured book tonight and that, it, well, there's two featured books. One is Love and Money and Sex and the other is Raving. Um, one is from our friends at Verso. The other is from our friends over at Duke University. And also, Anne Leslie had the kindness to bring blank signed book because we were having trouble with supply chain issues and could not get any of her books and are very, very contrite and apologetic for that. But boy, uh, you're in it for a treat tonight and for some great conversation, a little bit of background. Mackenzie is a writer, scholar, known for her writings on media theory, critical theory, new media, and the Situationist International. She's the author of A Hacker Manifesto, The Beast Beneath the Street, The Spectacle of Disintegration, amongst other titles. She recently completed a work that combines memoir and literary criticism by Kathy Acker. Uh, she teaches at the Eugene Lang College of Liberal Arts at the New School in Manhattan. So Anne Leslie is a poet, artist, and filmmaker. They are the author of the book, The Sun Cycle, as well as Blank Sign Book, as I mentioned. Amongst others, Anne Leslie's writing can be found in Annulet, Jacket 2, The Chicago Review, amongst others, as well as in anthologies and exhibition catalogs. Together with Lynn Sachs, Anne Leslie produced the film Girl Is Presence. Their uh, moving image and performance work has appeared in international short film festivals, uh, also the Moscow International Experimental Film Festival, the Berkeley Art Museum, also on the Criterion Channel, as well as other spaces. Anne Leslie has uh, received numerous honors for their work, which include the CSU Poetry Center Book Prize, as well as the Gazing Grain Prize. So I want to remind everyone online, we have posted links with which you may purchase books. Uh, now, uh, when it comes to blank sign book, that can only be purchased here by you. And we'll kind of make sure that we'll figure out how to do that uh, since she brought those in. Uh, thank you both for being with us. Such a thrill. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you all for coming on a on a Monday. Ah, we thought we would both read a little bit. Uh, we have some some overlapping interests in dancing and altered states and rhythm and things like that. And uh, then we'd have a little chat after. Do you want to you want to go first? Yeah, go for it. Hi, oh, thank you so much for coming. Um, a lot of Reeve Hotline is here. Um, yeah, so I um, read with Mackenzie um, about a year ago, um, the beginning of Club Space, which is um, a project I started before the um, lockdown and then set aside and then resuscitated for um the writing on raving reading series um it's so nice to be reading with you again um so that's what i'm reading from today and um we're starting in media rays in the middle at a rave she's off my pastel gazelle i sink into the big red couch the safest space is smooth i say to no one in particular no bureaucracy only color and sound for order Aaron slides in, only color and sound. In the speaker, old warm guitar cancels the invisible high-pitched vibration of infinite forms of capital. See, I think she points her horns out at the dancing throngs of gorgeous girls and fags about sex. Aaron's thinking about sex as the absolute and proportional inverse of art. A shadow world of signs, but inside the body, the most potent communication and the most mute. I'm getting excited. I'm launching into a story. 
I tell Aaron, when Cassie fisted me on a black satin sheet, time was a dial clicking one notch clockwise or counterclockwise. The swan of her hand closed inside me, and somewhere outside this feeling, Cassie wore a loose pink magenta dress, perfectly matched to her lipstick, Sarcodi Sanguea, or blood red flesh. The composition of Cassie gorgeously expressing the romance of her blonde patterned hair. Jewel was there, kissing a sentence of letters across my forehead. We were all on a tall four-poster bed in a dungeon tucked into a quiet East Oakland residential street. Cassie's arm inside me, up to her wrist. I tried to understand the sensation. I was making a model, or a model was making me. This reaching for understanding pushed me up against time, dropping suddenly off a cliff. I floated in nothing. Nothing was inside me. Then Cassie twisted her fist. Time turned. From inside sunshineless nothing, the image called back a world, but a different one. The needle lifted, lifted was put back down on a different record. I stay till morning, a new day papering gently blew so fast. We're back in the present now. Cassie smiles, wiggling thinly back into the couch. She's sweaty and vibrational. Now I'm in my real place, my birth border. Erin has a luscious grace she throws out front in the form of goth arms, horizontally climbing space, which is time, which is sound. You're the thinnest girl I know. How do I even deal with that, asks Cassie, who's thinner? My masochism turns to a form of worship. Every single thing that has ever said no in me gets on its knees before the thinness of Cassie and the thinness of Erin. I am shot through with blue-green. Red-purple light crumbles. Techno beats cotton to see. I simultaneously burrow my right hand up into Cassie's dress and my left hand over the dark of Erin's legs underneath her tight black skirt. I'm touching them both in love-like syncopation that is like having two hearts. My eyes are closed. Two gorgeous faces light me. A heavy curtain falls. I lay my head down. Cassie strokes my hair. I am a cat fox girl thing. Aaron folds two fingers into my mouth like a letter entering an envelope. I tongue the place between them. She squeezes me. I hoist myself half up, foxing the architecture of what I imagine as desire. A cinema image telescopes in. It's me. I always see myself here from the outside. It is the music of the eyes, I say to myself. The target of my mouth's desire is Aaron's desire, my mouth an acre of arcs of water to irrigate the gorgeousness of, ple of pleasure. Aaron is velvet and articulate. Cassie challenges my mooning with assertive afternoon sunshine, as if burning a square on the floor through a window. The fire of her rushes at me from behind. She buries her hand in my hair, pulls. Cassie is touching me. I am a multicolored mountain building. Thick, liquefied color sloths off my mountainsides like melting crayons. How holding this is awkward for me. Cassie turns to speak to Aaron. So Cassie's been doing these like political soliloquies on gentrification and like tech domination, like while we were making out before. Sometime toward the beginning of the century, we stepped through language, certainly not the most powerful material, but very contagious, unrelenting reproduction unhinged. Aaron's eyes are closed. She says, in a very long way that could be answering Cassie and could be answering the red and purple light pulsing to the goose down feathers of my tongues. 
foot to foot bilateral sinuous torso hair flip. We have no need of myth or symbol. Leaves fall like words accruing boot stomps in the crust of the earth where we rename ourselves against putrefying narratives. When we repeat, this order must be destroyed. Some do not even know what order is meant. We've been used against ourselves, gulped into fire, self as totality, a system for transporting language. The current age is one of satire, every appearance exactly, precisely, and unbelievably as expected. Cassie has been finger fucking me for her whole soliloquy, I scream. Two, I think we've reached infinity. It feels like a reoccurring goth night each Monday. The lights are red and purple. The songs is emotional synths that stretch out into femme pop vocals then twist down to beats. I am here in ballet shoes. Ramona is here in her LED light collar. Erin is here breaking space with lonely grace. Her green hair is shining, a glow. The couple in the corset and turbo boots trade spins. They have been dancing at the end of time since the end of time. I get a drink. $10 wine in a can is the manna of the moth, the juice of the fay, man's ruin if man were us, which he is not. We are here. We are requesting songs or running to the bathroom. Cassie is here. She is kneeling at the edge of the dance floor. She dressed Futch in a suit coat and man's shoes, but it made her feel bad. Kneeling makes her feel better. I dance with no shame, downloading grace. I wiggle my ass in her face. She giggles. We are here at the very edge of time. Oh shit, dead can dance. A brassy bass voice unrolls an urgent narrative. A high voice winds definitive velvet one rotation right, then refurls one rotation left. I lift my arms above my head, make a full spin right, spin back, a full revolution left. The quality of time turning is the sensorial depth of the dead breaking open and out toward the future in an overlay of notes drifts past. Cassie is kneeling at the edge of the dance floor. I am inside her gaze. I am here and never dying. The next day is zipped up with latex, boys and bears, puppies and fays fucking in the street. On the bondage stage, a femme in bleach warm pink pigtail suspends a naked princess with irrationally long red hair and gigantic red platforms. The top gets on the ground pushes her heels into the captive's flesh. It gives profile shot. I don't know if I want to watch a top in pigtails or be a top in pigtails. Aaron and I lean up against the railing one level above the dance floor at the after rave. And the dark room next to us is a tiny anti-condo into which pink light and techno pump beyond one-sided glass. Aaron gives silent signal. We walk in. We slide into the only unbodied spot. An unfurled night flower lays languidly in subspace next to us. Erin asks to touch. Her hands cut and decorate the air around the flower, now identified as one of Goth Knight's pizza girls who works at the restaurant adjacent to the club. I begin to sprout in the dark. I raise my arms, discover a rivet in the ceiling, grasp it with my hands, suspend my weight. When I come down... I also touch the flower. Dark blue unpuzzling ocean crests back into dark blue sea. Simultaneity. We were never apart, always just each other. We decide to flog the flower. I grab her thick ass cheeks, strike down each leg over long striped stockings pulled with perfect symmetry over each knee. The flower's hair is very, very long. Her body is impossibly soft. I tell her this in the language of animal praise. Aaron sounds endorsement. The lyric love of the owner who needs their pet or plant to be soft and glowing and accessible, in bliss, well-fed, responsive, and ready to beg. The flower does not beg. She quietly asks me as I miraculously find my butterfly earring on the dark room floor if sometime we can play again. 
Downstairs on the dance floor, I'm dumb and sparkling. I claw towards jouissance with a pod of dolphins in fishnet and platforms. Moving spreads it out, spreads it around the room, lights the ocean of our bodies. I am dancing at the edge of nothing, which is everything. Between this height and gilded, with many a crooked curve, a river of arrows slopes obliquely towards an ecstatic pantheon. Morning glory, spirit core, each omnipresent God is extended towards infinity beyond its core place in heaven. The word movement, the full deployment of the potential in a collective body, the potency when our bodies become movement. You do not see me unless you see me moving. A maid nod strikes to the middle of the floor in long fingerless gloves, spans her arms to each side. She whips her head, her black hair follows. She lunges, one leg bent, one leg bellied behind. In this stance, she bows. She looks left, takes a step left, lifts her elbows, presses her wrists to her forehead, where two long black gloves meet in prayer. Jewel texts, remembering dancing is like trying to remember sex, semiotics on the dance floor in a language never spoken again. I look up and people are leaving the floor like animals going extinct. Thanks. Well, thank you for having me, San Francisco. Um, so raving was sort of a, a love letter to the Brooklyn queer and trans rave scene as it currently exists. That sort of like took me in. Uh, I was like a raver in the 90s. And then I took like a 20 year chill out and then I sort of like came back and, and they'll still have me. <laughs> uh, and then Love, Money, Sex and Death is uh, also letters, but a bit more in letter form. Uh, and in three sections, and it's just sort of mothers, mothers, lovers, and others. Ah, oh, excuse me, I just need more water. Thank you. Uh, so the the first section is, you know, my my birth mother died when I was six. So there's two letters to her uh, in absentia, a, a letter to my sister who raised me. I was raised by teenagers, which I think is probably fairly obvious <laughs> if, if you know me at all. So that's mothers, and then lovers is uh, current, you know, exes and my current girlfriend. And I'm going to read from the, the others section, which is the third part of the book, uh, which has uh, a letter about uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, a letter, uh, wow, what even is the third one? Now I can't remember. <laughs> but the, the one I want to read is actually a prayer uh, to the goddess Sibyl. Uh, and that's a very strange thing to write as an atheist, but I just sort of felt like yeah, would be an interesting form to get to. And it's kind of like loop back to our shared interest in nightlife and dancing, club space and things like that. So here goes, it's just called To Seville. <clears throat> I've never written to a god before, Seville, let alone one who to the Greeks and Romans was mother of all gods. It's not a thing an atheist usually does. Gods are always all the things we say they are, even if they're contradictory. Order and chaos, sameness and difference, death and creation. I just want other ways of saying your name, other rites that might entreat you, Sibyl. Goddess of thresholds, transitions of the mountains and the city, of the deep, dark, silent cave and of the noisiest street rave. You came from the east, from Phrygia, and we're always something, we're always something exotic, other, troubling to Greek or Roman tastes. Nonetheless, they used you for their colonial projects as they pleased. They tried to tame you, yet, that, yet there you sat with a lion in your lap. The lion answers to you and you to nobody. To the Greeks, you're an underground sensation, popular with outsiders. They rove themselves in your otherness and embroidered on it made you one of their rave gods, singing and dancing and getting high as fuck. All the same to you, gods are protean, take whatever work you can get. It's what came with you that was trouble. The Greeks and Romans wanted you, Sibyl, but not Attis, your lover, and what Attis might signify. They had to change the myth of Attis so they wouldn't have to change their world. They changed the sequence of your myth to suit the ruling order. 
the one thing their version of Seville and Attis has right is that this love cut deep. The Attis you loved was a shepherd, an ordinary worker, ordinary but also not. Attis was neither a man nor a woman as they understand those things. In the language of my time, Attis was trans, a tea girl, a tall girl, a girl like us. It's a scandal as we're not supposed to be loved, just fucked. You loved Attis and your love didn't waver. Attis loved you back, Sibyl, but not so well. Addis could not love herself. Hi, you want to come in, have a seat? Addis could not love herself. Addis, from the start, is what we now call trans, and you knew that and loved her anyway. She just couldn't believe in your love, Sibyl. I know that feeling. When I transitioned, I thought I'd never be loved again. Not believing in your love, Ad Addis went off and fucked some other girl. Trust me, hon, it's nothing. But it made you so terribly sad. The thunder and the floods, the fires and the ga gales. It's your pain and rage, which is why we party so hard for you, as if it might cheer you up. The one constant in the stories is the part that's right. Addis takes a blade and cuts her nuts off. It's the sequence that got altered. Change from a story about offering to a story about ordering. Addis does not want to de-nut out of penance for having left you for another. She did it long before. It's how the story starts. She cut and offered them to you. It's how you met. It's two gestures, the cut for herself, the gift for you. Not a sacrifice. Addis feels well read. Addis remakes her body and honors you as the goddess of the power to remake the world. This is what they never understand. If you are the goddess of creation, why take Tigal, the Tigal Atis as your lover? Because creation is not just procreation. You are the goddess of all makings and doings, of all the ways the world edits and arranges its elements. Goddess of praxis. That's why Atis offers her cut flesh to you for love of the world. Your making isn't pure, Sabeel. There's always a little art, a little techniques. Something girls like us know well. You've always had a special relation to us tea girls. To give us our ancient name, we are the galley, the celebrants of Sibyl. By the time the Romans came around, we galley had a look and could carry. We wore robes of mauve and saffron sprinkled in trinkets, hair bleached and braided long, perfumed with myrrh, tall caps instead of crowns, a makeup bright and vulgar, icons strung around our breasts. We danced to wild music, to drums and cymbals, tambourines and double flutes. We sashayed down the main drag. On our feast day, even Romans threw roses at our feet because every tea girl deserves her roses now. The Romans gawked and cheered, but only when we made a spectacle of ourselves. We were too much for those uptight breeders. They made us the, the domesticated other to their self-same selves, like house cats. Rome in its day, oh fuck, what did I just do? <laughs> of course I left the actual script in my hotel room, so I'm reading off my phone. There we go. Rome in its day, it was Hollywood and the Pentagon all in one, all spectacle and violence. They bought out any cult they thought good for morale. You were recruited in the war against the African Hannibal. You probably didn't help them win Sabeel but we let them think you did. The Romans wanted you, but not us galley. We came as part of a package deal. Those Roman hacks who wrote, wrote about us couldn't decide if we were a joke or a threat. The galley, tea girls, were the score of the cut where the otherness appears, an otherness both alien and most intimate right here in the flesh. When the Romans acquired the IP to your cult, Sibyl, they tried to fate you their way, killing rams and bulls, paddling about in puddled blood. Then they'd go off to watch sports. That's Romans for you. I sometimes think their slave state never ended. We galley became part of this spectacle for them to gawk at in the street. It's a living. Then came the Christian sky god cult. They just flat out hated us. Their idea of the sacred is flesh-hating misery. That's not for us. We don't sacrifice. We're now. 
We dance with chants, with ululation, even cut our own flesh to feel the thrill of chosen pain. We go into flesh, into this wounded life and through its nerve merge with worlds. Say I'm not here for the cutting, but I do take pleasure from the pain of a tattoo in a sensitive spot or two. The first time I ever called your name, Sabil, I lay face down on a table while our sister Larch Needle Needles carved her pretty twisty lines on the back of my left thigh. Getting ink by Larch Needles took my pain level to an 11 out of 10 for three hours. I called your name, Sabil, in vain, I knew. Yet still the calling helped. There's no bargaining with you. The pain, the plagues, that's all you too. There's not much here for us mortals but the passing show of life. Your girls know a thing or two about that. Reading Roman and Christian writers on the galley, I sense the oh-so-familiar mix of fascination and revulsion. The classic scholars of my time aren't much better. I read between the lines. The galley drinking pregnant horse piss to keep the skin smooth and grow tits. The galley making coin for the temple selling ass to those Roman pricks. The tea girl loving galleys tea for tea sex and feelings and trans strike drama. So much drama. A liaisons on the down low with respectable citizens never to be acknowledged in public, for whom sometimes our asses are the threshold to your threshold. Like the time I hooked up with Jane, met on a dating app, drinks and confessions, it's remarkable what people tell girls like this. Back to her hotel, I'm working with tongue and fingers on cunt and clit. She starts to cry. I hold her. Nobody has touched her like that in a while. But it's more that nobody has heard her story, what she'd said over drinks, that sometimes there's someone else. Sometimes she's Jane and sometimes David. Are you David now? Yes. Would he like to come? Yes. So I lubed my fingers in David's juices and fucked his hole with them. And he came and cried all at once. Then I held him for a spell until Jane sweetly bid me leave. When I read about you and us, Sibyl, what I sense most of all is galley mothering fresh girls into existence, into the life, and doing so in ritual garments, not depending on cis doctors and their hospital gowns. I see our covens of care, no doubt with lots of fights and feuds, that side of our brittle wife was there too. We had our special days in Rome to be seen and then pushed aside again, like Pride Month in New York, or probably in San Francisco. Not much has changed. A handful of spectacular tea girls are allowed to flit about the bright edges of the culture industry, or like me, academia. That token visibility does nothing for the rest. We're just a few fake creatures, but the cisheads panic easily. Imagine the horror they might feel if beyond what they saw of us, they caught a glimpse of you, Sabina. We're just decoration to your most radical concept, that your powers of creation go beyond mere procreation, and more challenging still, that your powers of destruction go beyond near death. The end of the human, even the end of all life on Earth, could be just the flick of a claw, the Sibelacene. And then the part we play, that there could be femme forms that have nothing to do with procreation, to birth and suck. Loads be known for tea gold tit to give out milk. The avatar of which could only be us, the galley. We who drank from the druggy river that bade us shed a manhood we felt as madness. It's been hard for me to love this world as it is. It's been hard for me to love this body as it is. To the love of this world, of this body, as it is, I give your name, Sibyl. I write your prayer toward, I write my prayer toward your vast indifference. I'm not expecting you will answer. Even your absence has its uses. When I call your name, Sibyl, the calling, it's not for you, it's for us. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you, thank you. It's like the cold or not. Cold or is, that's like, is this spring in San Francisco? Is this what it's like? I got to go to Chicago on on this tour where like when I looked at the the weather it's like oh it's freezing there great like oh, oh joy looking forward to that 
Um, so, you know, um, we could call this uh, the Dionysian, but it seems like that's yeah. really played out. You know? <laughs> um, fun language for these things that we do. I immediately have a response to your um to your, to the portion about the non-reproductive femme um and I'm trying to remember what the line was after that but um even though I um have reproduced um and I guess you have pro so progeny <laughs> um uh I that's how and why I started writing about sex was this project of finding like a power finding an energy um outside of um the the uses or the usefulness or the um just a completely autonomous femme culture it was like a fantasy um I don't know so that I really like that section oh thank you yeah that's that's sort of it you know like what's um femme and we sort of have to honor lesbian culture for inventing the original meaning of that word but yeah uh yeah what's what's femme as a kind of ambience that um alights on different kind of bodies at different times uh, and isn't necessarily the property of any of them uh, and where do you find that like where are the places where one might experience that um not necessarily utopia i was kind of like hinting at you know um i don't know i mean you when you're in community with other, other trans women boy does it get messy yeah <laughs> yeah but the but the under the fact that it sort of still dwells in an undefined place like w with this potentiality in it to maybe change human culture you know to break to I don't know to break something or to break outside because it's so not it's it's amorphous it's it's like I think of femme as like a creative force anyway yeah um oh I remember what the third letter in the third section is it's about aesthetics it's mm. about yeah the power of the false uh and the 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 virtue of the false the virtue of appearances mm. and for me, there's a, a femme out of appearances mm -hmm. um, that uh, it's the, the power is one of, of withdrawing behind appearances when necessary, mm -hmm. uh, being able to play with them uh, and create new things out of them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was, that was the third letter in the third section. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just sorry. <laughs> Why do gods appear at raves? They do though, don't they? Maybe we should put that to the audience. Yeah. I know you've been to one or two. <laughs> yeah, and which ones? You know, like it's uh maybe there's ones that don't have names yet, too, you know. Um I the thing I like particularly like about um techno is it doesn't have liturgy usually. Like house music still does, and I respect that, but I wasn't raised in the church, so like it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, but but techno is is sort of like um, a certain kind of invocation uh, that doesn't have uh, any sort of liturgy to it at all, mm -hmm. and I kind of like that. Um, Sorry, how did you get to that thought? Like, do you mean because there's not like lyrics, or is that what you mean? Or maybe I'm being stupid. I mean, house music is black gay music from Chicago, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the clubs would play through Saturday night into Sunday morning to an audience who were mostly raised in the church but can't go to it. And so, like, black gay DJs would often play gospel in the morning because it's like, well, here's the feeling that you're missing. Mm -hmm. And then you can hear it all through um, house music in its origin is the the cadences of black church mm -hmm. uh and i i kind of love that but from afar because it's not my culture mm -hmm. and i'm not even from christianity mm -hmm. um and and also my ancestors three generations ago were presbyterians which is about as far from like a, a sonic danceable christian culture as you can get um but techno doesn't have that it's a very secular 
sound, or so it seems. Mm. But um, when you put a few hundred people together mm. who know what they're looking for with it, and some light and some fog <laughs> and some chemistry, you know, yeah, like something happens. But you know, when when I was doing interviews for um, raving, I always got the same questions, mm -hmm. but they weren't really questions. It was sort of overcoding the language of the book with ones that people were familiar with. So they'd mm. go like, oh, so your book is about raving as transcendence. And I go, no. So it's about utopia. No. So it's about resistance. No. <laughs> like, could we come up with another language for these things? Because mm. maybe we don't have ones that describe what it is now. We use those languages in the 90s, you know, that what is it now? Are you asking me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I also wanted to ask if club space and subspace are intentionally. Yes. Yeah. Tell me about that. Mm. Um, well, maybe that's like a play, like that's an industry talking about the rave is like a um, uh, sort of uh, a different level of consciousness, um, like a um, assault is the wrong word but like an assault um a, a kind of like um a full a filling of the senses an overfilling of the senses to to this point that one is taken into it or is inside of something just this the sense of being inside of something and just even like the markers you mentioned the lights the music um the smoke you know all of it creating a space yeah i love it when there's a lot of fog mm -hmm. uh, and there's there's parties in new york you your visibility is down to about you know like nine inches and you literally feel <laughs> your way into it it helps to know the venue in advance and you're like because it's like you know there's one that's got a ramp that suddenly slopes down and it's like <laughs> break a hip doing this is like keep, keep <laughs> And it's interesting to me how it reorders the senses. So it's like, oh, you don't see so well. Um, and sometimes it's not even about sound. Like I wear earplugs. Uh, so you, you feel the music rather mm -hmm. than hear it necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like kinesthetics and sound that's felt, you know, sort of with the whole body. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you sort of change the order of the senses a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and it helps to do with people who know what they're doing, who can then find that way to be sort of like intimate um which can be sexual but doesn't have to be at all you know like it's just you're just with other bodies in this sort of intimate way um, oh, i miss that i haven't done this for a while because i was out of town mm -hmm. yeah why do we crave this mm. <laughs> that's such a big question um why do you crave it? <laughs> um, all right. So head case, like writer, you know. Uh, so it takes like a very intentional practice to get out of that, um, you know, being locked in my own head sensibility. Um, I, the raving is very much an aesthetics of dissociation, and it's not that for everybody, but, and also dissociation can very much be a bad thing, but maybe there's dissociative aesthetics and a good rave will get you into that sense of detachment that then sort of like reattaches to something else. So like mm. reassociates. And um, I was trying to sort of develop languages for um, different kinds of dissociative aesthetics. And I've got four in, in the book and there's more, like you could find more. They're just the ones I happen to have access to. Uh, so it's like, oh, there's like whole repertoires of um, a set of experience that we can create languages for here that existing ones maybe don't work so well with. So isn't that great? You know, if you've been writing about painting for like now a thousand years, not yeah. you can do with that, but like the right, like actually there's, there's, I think there's ways that aren't fully explored for how to think it. Yes. The book that is not available, um, Sun Cycle, I wrote about beauty and a lot of it is about the subject object relation in Western art and just the subject object like rule of beauty and the rave is breaking that. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which is um, Apollo and Dionysus. But uh, do we know this book? Nietzsche's uh, Birth of Tragedy and, and it has these two famous aesthetic categories 
Uh, so the Apollonian is yeah, the separation of subject and object, uh, contemplation, but also uh, dreamlike states uh, and its contemporary version with the cinema. Uh, and its opposite is the Dionysian, which is states of intoxication and dance is the classic form of it. But there's a paragraph after this where Nietzsche goes, well, when I talk about the Dionysian, I don't mean like the barbarians do because mm. that just seems wild mm. and, and sexual. Mm -hmm. and I'm not talking about mm -hmm. that. And it's like, honey, I am. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. That's, we want the one that isn't in the, the can canonic Western version of what that aesthetic would be, you know, mm. like what's in that space. Um, but I thought I'd make Sibyl the god of it rather than Dionysus um, because it's all a creation, you know, like Sibyl is the whole thing, you know, mother of all gods. <laughs> There is like a urge in me when I think I first started going to the rave, the urge was to be back in the street, like protesting, you know, I, and I, all, I felt like it was the same people there or to be in the swarm, yeah. to be like in the, in the crowd, in the street moving. Um, and the, I didn't mention that some lines uh, in what I read are from other people's writing and the part about collective movement, the potential in the collective body is actually from Bifo Berardi. Um, we we're talking about this and, um, but, but yeah, it's not, um, it's not political and it's not, it, it, it's not aiming anywhere. It's, it's like the movement is circular, right? Yeah. I, it's, I don't think it's helpful to try to make rave immediately like a political thing uh but uh at the height of um movement for black lives the people that uh i wanted to show up with on the street and remember you know new york city was doing curfews uh so the cops were trying to like you know round people up so this whole thing about you know right to the city was going on but the people I wanted to be around were people I knew from Rave World because it's people who know about movement and space and bodies and how to corporeally act together. Like that was, oh, we learn stuff, which isn't politics, but it is a form of embodiment that's useful in that space. Plus also we're all in the same Discord, so, you know. <laughs> You'd be like, <laughs> well, I'm on such as that and such that so you have at least have semi-private like communication to go or there was a signal group too you know uh go go find your people yeah yeah and so yeah maybe politics isn't everything but uh there's power in uh culture you know there's power in aesthetics there's power in hesitate to call it the spiritual because you know that gets into some you know, kind of burner nonsense pretty quickly. Um, sorry, I'm from New York. I just don't, we don't do any of that shit. You know. <laughs> we don't either. None of us. <laughs> yeah. But whatever would be in that space, you know, like something has to be in that space, I think, but we don't have good versions of it. I had this fantasy though, that like when like, oh, the shit comes down and like the system fails, that those are going to be the people with the generators, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, like uh, there were um, during the uh, COVID lockdown, there were like street parties in New York, like renegades. And it's like, yeah, there were people who had the skill to like show up, like put the decks and the, and the generator down, uh, sell nutcrackers. They're probably not called that here yet. It's like alcohol and fruit juice in a plastic bag in New York's called a nutcracker. You know? Never heard of it. That's a whole story. <laughs> But like you need that, you know, and, and so it's just all laid on. It was like a free food truck would show up and all that, you know, it's like, yeah, like people got some mad skill. Yeah. I've been to raves that have um, free estrogen, you know, trans led raves. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a gateway drug. <laughs> it's the slowest drug in the world. It's kind of great. like, you know, acid is like an eight hour commitment right you know but um yeah like estrogen is acts so slowly it takes days for anything to happen and it happens for a week you know it's like what else works like that you know? um we could ask people in the audience if anyone has any thoughts about it. i feel like comments are also fine like you don't have to yeah. like uh, pretend it's like 
Um, so I'm just curious if you, if the two of you could talk a little bit maybe about uh, privacy and how like privacy exists in sort of a club setting and maybe how the absence of privacy elsewhere is maybe something that's coming up for the two of you? And open, open question. Yeah, it, it wasn't the uh, the word for it that I used, but the uh, parties that I'm particularly drawn to, uh, I'd say they're discreet. Uh, you know, there's one you only know about if you're on their Discord. Uh, there are some that you could, you know, if, you, if you've got the name of it, you could find the Instagram and, and go from there. Uh, when you get there, there's a sort of unevenly enforced uh, no phone on the dance floor rule uh, and a fairly consistently enforced, like, no photo, you know, like, let's just get off your goddamn phone, you know? And it's funny, when I, I teach this stuff to undergrads, you know, like, and this is like my selling point, it's like, there's a thing that will engage your attention long enough that you won't have looked at your phone for at least an hour. And they're like, what is it? How is that possible? And I'm like, yeah, I have this problem too. I'm just like constantly, you know. Um, so yeah, and then that butts up against questions around sort of exclusivity. Um, and yeah, the one that you only know about on the private Discord is pretty fucking exclusive because we just like it that way. Like you go and everybody knows how to dance. Everybody can handle their drugs. Everybody's cool around sex in public. Everybody is fine with trans people. You know, like, and that's none of those things apply in regular club space, you know. Um, and it's one that you get to after a few other stages, you know, like you go to a few regular clubs for a while and then you follow some DJs and you meet some Ray friends. And before you know it, you're in, you know, like you're in this world. So, yeah, I think about it more as discretion that, that maybe it's useful to create kind of discrete worlds that are. Uh, not advertising themselves. They're really not meant to go on TikTok. You're kind of going to ruin the vibe if you do that. And in a city like New York, there's nightlife for everybody. You know, like if you want, like I, I love club kids. I just don't want to go to the same parties, you know. Like there's a place where, where visibility could be one of the key experiences, you know. Um, if you want to... Uh, you know, there's this topology of types of people you meet in nightlife in raving, you know, and there is what I call co-workers. And I am one a lot of the time, you know, it's like people who want like are, to, to really get hammered on their night out. So they have a great story to tell their co-workers on Monday morning, you know, and they're just a lot to be around because it's like a special thing. And I'd rather be around people who do this all the time, a little relaxed about it. Uh, I'd rather not be around punishers who feel like, they're having a good time is at your expense, you know, or the other kind of punisher who is internal to the scene, who feel, who, who internalized being the cop of it, you know, that have to police it. That's no fun either, you know? So yeah, like where, where do you find ravers as like sort of specific kind of social type? Well, it takes a little bit of, let's say privacy, but discretion about, you know, where that filters into the thing about ravers though, is that most of us don't drink a whole lot and most of us are list so parties don't make money off us. So they're always mixed economies with other kinds of people in there. I have a question for Mackenzie. So how did you come to the letter format um, for love and money, sex and death? And did you know it was gonna end in a prayer? <laughs> um, I'm kind of obsessed with, um, uh, genres that uh, aren't respectable or minor. Like I love minor genres. Uh, <laughs> I write theory. I write autofiction. I write epistolary. Uh, and I've been, actually been trying to write this book for 25 years uh, and it failed over and over again. Uh, and then I wrote it like accidental epistolary autofiction or published one, which was the letters between Kathy Acker and myself, the emails. And it's like, oh, damn, that actually, like by accident is like a, a epistolary autofiction novel, you know, it's sort of what it is. And, and, and it's like, we just redacted some names for legal reasons, you know, otherwise it's exactly how it happened, you know? Um, 
so yeah so then I started there's one chapter in raving that's a letter to my girlfriend who goes by Jenny uh in these books and then that sort of those experiences led me to sort of then structure the whole of love and money as uh, as a series of letters and then it turned out there's a whole bunch of um trans writers were exploring it at the same time okay gabriel has this great book uh queen in bucks county the late cecilia gentili's felt us there's a whole bunch uh, and i'm like why are we doing this and i think there's a way that the epistolary allows uh you to model the reader of the book's relation to you as a minoritized subject by how you're responded to by the you in the text itself. So you sort of model uh, the you that's outside with the you that's inside, if that makes any sense. So I think that's sort of structurally how that happens. And it's sort of one of the things that shows up in the history of epistol epistolary, I can barely say it, uh, is that of, of that attempt to uh, manage manage readers' expectations or or play with them or mess with them? Uh, Victor Shlovsky's Zoo was a was, you know which the subtitle of which is um, letters not about love and they're based on real letters to Elsa Trolet who said you can write about anything except the fact that you love me and so he sort of like discourses around it in all these interesting ways. So yeah, that was how epistolary happened and. Uh, so it's mothers, lovers, and others. And then there's framing letters where I write to myself and I write to myself at 20. And in the original version of the book, my 20 year old self wrote back and my editor was like, you can't end the book with this because it's just angry. And it's like, yeah, I was just really mad at the fucking world when I was 20 years old. You know, <laughs> like, I, I don't know if you have this expression in American English, but full of piss and vinegar was that, that was the, the vibe. Uh, so I ended up writing a second letter to myself at 40. Because at 40, nobody tells you what to do anymore. But damn, do you need it? You know, I was, I was like floundering. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And now, so it's like from the point of view of 60, I thought I had some thoughts about that, you know. So it's sort of intervening at that, that stage of life. Yeah. So that's sort of the, how the letter structure sort of worked out um, for uh, my love and money. And I've also had that title for um, 30 years. I've been trying to write the book that would have that title. Hi, I have a question to you both. Uh, what's in your ray bag? I know Mackenzie wrote about that. Um, maybe you have an um, updated version. I'm curious. Oh, goodness. Um, lipstick. Um, either mushrooms or MDMA. So, like very, very occasionally. Um, hmm. Water. Well, no, I usually get water there. Um, I mean, a notebook these days. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I still have the same bag. I've been using the same bag for years. Uh, let me see. Wallet, phone, keys, uh, ketamine, uh, weed, uh, earplugs. That one's really crucial. Fan. Um, but I don't have those ones that people snap, <laughs> you know, because like, honey, if you're not gay, don't do that. Okay. Yeah. Just don't, just, just don't do them. You know? So I just have one for, you know, fanning myself. Uh, I think that gum, oh, I always take a bar of chocolate. Uh, cause you know, like I, I have the metabolism of a greyhound or something. I need like regular intake of food, you know, so we have like snacks, uh, bar of chocolate, um yeah i think that's about it yeah that's that's the kit yeah. earplugs are really key though i'm an evangelist for earplugs who is one of your favorite thinkers right now i keep going back to bataille you want that first? i think that question was to you um actually but Bataille came back up when I was writing Raving. Um, I wasn't raised Catholic, so part of me is like, dude, what, what is going on? <laughs> like, this part of it is just like I'm just never going to get. Uh, I, I learned a lot about um, scenes and the sentence um, and, and histrionics 
from uh, City Likes published The Impossible, actually. I, I read The Impossible. And it's like, talk about histrionics, you know, like uh, he really was not afraid to, to go there. Um, yeah, so Bataille is a bit of a, bit of a constant for me. Um, um, who lately? It's, um, well, I just, I edited the um, Susan Stryker Reader. Uh, we called it um, When Monsters Speak, Us, Susan Stryker Reader. And I really wanted to put together her early pieces, which were published in things like Taste of Latex. So they're not easy to source. Uh, and it, it also includes a famous essay on my words to Victor Frankenstein. But I wanted to create a context around that with these other pieces where uh, Susan is sort of thinking through the body uh, and through BDSM, which I'm, I'm very much a lightweight in that. But for me, raving was the sort of adjacent way of thinking through the body. So, um, uh, so yeah, I spent a lot of time with, with Susan and the way Susan thinks about uh, body and language uh, as sort of like entwined with each other. And it's like um, really useful way to get out of the Judith Butler space I found too. That's the way it, when Susan thinks. Yeah, so I think that's out later this year. It's the When Monsters Speak. Um, yeah, that was, yeah, that was a lot. That's what I've been thinking with. And and we're all, we're Susan and I are exact contemporaries too. And and our formative years were spent in very different gay towns. Uh, I was in Sydney, uh, super gay. She was in the Bay Area. Susan was out way, way before I was. I was attempting to be a gay man and failing. Um, in, in the same time period. So there's sort of reports from uh, the kind of things that Bohemias used to teach you since, and sort of still can. And that's raving is, you know, like everybody's always like, oh, the city is over the city. No, it's not. It just moved, you know, like in New York, downtown is definitely dead, but it's in Brooklyn, you know, but it moves so far into Brooklyn, it's Queens, you know, but there's, there's a scene. You can go find it. You know, it's just a little private. I'm going to ask you about artists. Which artists are like rocking your world? Gosh. Uh, I'm back on the other question. So I'm just going to say <laughs> Fred Moten is someone that um, who's thinking I'm really every thing that Fred is writing and the way that Fred's writing, everything he's writing, particularly his... Um, latest book all incomplete and theories of like the non the sort of non-self the non that the theory that individuality doesn't exist um and maybe shouldn't exist and that's like also some of what i'm playing with in my book um yeah actually fred's one of the the there's a lot of um quotes in raving and fred's one of the first ones uh, and it's the undercommons, but it's not, I didn't use that concept. There's another concept in that book I thought was interesting, which is the surround. Uh, and, and I think he's straight up got it from that movie Zulu. Have I seen this movie? It's, it's like a big budget, uh, actually British made, you know, colonial film, but where the Zulu are kind of the good guys. It's like this anti-colonial like artifact, but part of it's about, uh, the colonial outpost being surrounded uh, and being unable to see into the surround and the surround is a sonic space that's somewhere between uh, ind indigeneity, otherness, blackness, darkness, all those, all those sorts of things in typical Fred uh, fashion, these things like the categories slip between each other. So I thought surround was a useful way of thinking about uh, and, and a, a phrase of um, uh, Fred's from that book, the nightlife that ain't no good life uh is also is also surround uh and was a way to think the centrality of uh blackness in uh nightlife and dance music culture in the united states so yeah fred fred is in uh was central to raving but as far as art goes i was just in freaking madrid in the prado and it's like oh this is what Velasquez was really about. You know, I was raised on the reproductions and I'm suddenly confronted with the real thing, you know, like five rooms of it, you know, um, and, and like this massive empire that named half of California, you know, here we are in San Francisco. And it was just, it just made certain things like suddenly like fall together. 
and like, oh, that was an empire that rattled on for hundreds of fucking years. And one of the things it produced is this art. Just back to Fred for a second, Art. Um, I saw like a tiny piece that um, Wu Chang made um, with Fred Moten dancing, like ecstatically in a dashiki with like, um, um, what I want to say candelabra, but that like chandelier earrings. Um, and it was like a way that you don't usually see Fred. Um, and it was so beautiful. We we watched it and it was part of a two hour film program. And they we were trying to like uh, figure out our day so we could like spend two hours and like come watch it again. It's just a, just filmed on like an iPhone. So beautiful. Yeah. Well, the other thing that, that was useful in, in Undercommons is uh, the connection between blackness and transness that uh, Marquise Bay then has, has taken elsewhere. But uh, Fred gestures to Big Mama Thornton, who is unclassifiable in gender terms, and Little Richard, who also is unclassifiable, um, but performed as Princess Le Bon uh, for parts of, their, let's say, their uh, career. Uh, and Little Richard is a story that's early in Love and Money, Sex and Death, because Little Richard's conversion uh, back to Christianity may have happened in my hometown in Australia when he was on tour. It either happened in Sydney or in Newcastle, which is my hometown. I went with the Newcastle version for the legend for obvious reasons. Um, although maybe he went back to the church, not just for religious reasons, because he was so ridiculously exploited by his record company that he was making less than a quarter of a cent per record that was being sold. Uh, and my stepmother's first husband was in the record business and she met little Richard. Uh, and I'm like, what would that have been like? You know, like meeting this like white Australian lady in the fifties when you're from Macon, Georgia, yeah, I just boggles the mind to like think that through, but yeah, anyway. So there's a thread from Fred via little Richard, gender nonconformity and then the, the way this book starts. It, it actually, it starts with little Richard and ends with Prince. And also the way Fred uses they, pro like Fred doesn't use they pronouns, but Fred theorizes they as the kind of like they, them as a kind of like possible dissolution of like the individual, the singular self. I, I was just thinking after you like, you spend so long explaining like singular they is a thing in English, but then Fred is like, yeah, maybe it's not so singular, you know? <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> Um, thank you all for coming and thank you for being part of this conversation. Thank you for being here.